people have been studying human evolution for a long time, and ever since Darwin, of course, they've been studying it from a proper evolutionary perspective, and, and I've had the good fortune of being able to teach human evolution for a long time, and when I teach human evolution, and we, you go down to the wonderful exhibit downstairs, there's a, some basic questions that people in my field focus on. When and how and why did uh, we evolve bipedalism? Big brains, language, all sorts of things that we really care about. What forces shaped our evolution? These are very important questions, and they're really the nuts and bolts of our field. And as I've been teaching these questions for many years, I find that there's a, always a few students who really, really care about the answers to those questions. And they're, they're the ones who want to go on and become you know, professors of human evolutionary biology and anthropology. But most of them, eh, they learn it for the exam, but they're not really all that interested in those particular questions. They really want to know about their bodies. They want to know how and why is evolution relevant today to people's lives. And that's what I want to try to address today in this lecture. And it's not that I don't care about those first questions, I do, but I also think we should address those, the second set of questions. For example, how are our bodies evolving today? What does it mean to have Stone Age bodies in a sort of space age world? And how can studying evolution help us craft a better future for our bodies today as we, uh, as we deal with a lot of crises? So that's really going to be the focus of today's lecture. And so we'll start with the question of how are our bodies evolving today? So a quick review of evolution by natural selection. So there's basically three ingredients that by which evolution by natural selection occurs. First, you have to have variation. <coughs> then you have to have heritability, so those variations have to have some genetic basis. And finally, there has to be differential reproductive success, so individuals who have variations that, that make them more likely to have offspring that survive and reproduce will pass those on. And those who, for example, have variations that cause problems uh, with reproduction, uh, those, those variations get snuffed out in the next generation. So natural selection produced the modern human body, but it ain't over. It's still going on today, and I'm going to use the Bush family as my example here, but we all know <coughs> that the conditions for natural selection still exist. For example, there is still is variation. We all know that Jeb Bush and his brother are very different. We know that there's heritability. There's no question that number 41 and number 43 are related to each other. And there's also differential reproductive success. This bush has more, has more offspring than this bush has more offspring. And if so if, for example, one of these bushes has traits that may cause a benefit in terms of reproductive success, those will be more likely to be passed on in the next generation, et cetera, et cetera. So natural selection hasn't ended. It's still going on today. But we also have to acknowledge that there's another important evolutionary force that's going on in our, in our world today, and that's like a different kind of evolution. It's cultural evolution. The cultural evolution also, you know, well, culture is basically learned behavior. So cultures also evolve. They change over time. That's the basic definition of evolution. But two appear to be really fundamentally important. The first is the origins of farming, the agricultural revolution, which by growing food rather than simply foraging and hunting it, we were able to get a lot more food, and hence there was an increase in population size. But as people settled down in villages and started basically fouling their nests and, and cre creating more uh, opportunities for infectious disease. Also, there was an increase in disease burden. The second major revolution was the Industrial Revolution, where we started using machines to replace humans and animals to do our work, and we also invented science and medicine and all kinds of other good things, and that led to an explosion of more food and, of course, more people. But at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, times were pretty bad and infectious diseases rose, but with Pasteur and sanitation and various other transformations that occurred with the Industrial Revolution, we've been able to shift that and, and, and go to a condition with, well, with very little disease compared to previous times. We'll talk more about that in a second. Now, cultural evolution has a number of important effects, and, it does, and one of the important effects is that it can spur biological evolution. We know that since the origins of agriculture, for example, there's been selection for in at least seven different parts of the world for people to be able to digest milk as in milk sugars as an adult. Because we know that people were able to move into habitats that, um, that varied in their, um, uh, in their um, solar radiation, and so there's variation in skin color that evolved. We know that there's been evolution, for example, of different kinds of hair and sweat glands, for example work that we just recently published on what goes on in Asia. There's variation in all kinds of metabolic genes. There's variation in, in genes that are important in infectious disease response. So we know that evolution has been going on since uh, the origins of modern humans, some of it driven by cultural changes that actually change the environment in which we live, which create new selective conditions for natural selection to act. A lot of people think, oh, well, you know, the go it, you know everything's worse today, right? And you, you, uh, you know, it's all been downhill. I mean, Jared Diamond wrote a very famous essay saying that, um, that uh, at the origins of agriculture was the worst mistake in, the, in human history. But actually, um, 
today is probably a pretty good time to live. In fact, I would probably not want to live in any other era in human history. I'm pretty happy to be a 21st century human. We've made an enormous progress in terms of uh, the health of our bodies over the, last, over the last few thousand years, especially the last few hundred years, thanks to medicine and sanitation and transportation, all sorts of good things. And I want to give you a little bit of a little bit of, sort of data to help make you feel good about being a 21st century human before we get to the really depressing stuff that's supposed to come. So let's start with um, infant mortality. And of course, there's no exact records of infant mortality during the Paleolithic, but we can guess that you know, in most populations it was somewhere between 30 and 50 percent. During the farming era, actually, um, um, infant mortality remained quite high. 30 to 40 percent is a reasonable estimate of infant mortality rates for most of the time in which humans have been farming. But today, infant mortality rates in developed countries like the U.S. are less than 1 percent. This is a really unusual circumstance to be a human being. We, like parents, most of us expect our children to survive and, and grow up and, and, and give us grandchildren. It's, it's a kind of a normal expectation today, but uh, that was never the case in forever in human evolutionary history. This is a very, very new thing. Adult mortality, something we all care about a lot too, has also shifted recently well. So, so today, people in developed countries like the U.S. can live to 70 to 80. But during the era of farming, people actually died much younger for the most part. Expected mortality was about 40 to 50 in most farming populations for most of human history. People often assume that's true of hunter-gatherers, but actually, hunter-gatherers, if they survive childhood, actually lived to be pretty long, and most of them lived between about 60, 70, sometimes up into their 80s. So actually, uh, we're actually pretty much back up to where we used to be, maybe a little bit higher, but we're much better than we were during the era of farming. And as a result, you have m fewer children dying and people living longer. There's been, of course, an explosion in population. And it sort of starts, you know, of course, in the Paleolithic. We know that populations must have started rising after the origins of agriculture. But of course, with the Industrial Revolution, things took off exponentially. And now there are more than 7 billion people on the planet, and we expect more than 9 billion people by the end of the century. So, so from that perspective, we're doing really pretty well as a species. How about stature? Stature is actually a pretty useful um, um, uh, parameter to look at because it kind of is a reasonable measure of overall health. You, you, you have a certain genetic potential you can grow to. So, so your height has a high heritability. Many, many genes determine your height, but what but many people don't reach their genetic height because of problems they encounter during development. If you look at the height of overall populations, it tells you something about their overall health. And we know that the male hunter-gatherers in Europe were about five foot eight inches tall. And then the earliest farmers in Europe were pretty tall, and then people shrank, right? They shrank because farming was pretty miserable for most of these folks. They were getting all kinds of horrible, nasty diseases. They were getting malnutrition. They were basically living in around their feces and other people's feces, so they're getting cholera and all kinds of horrible d diseases. I mean, being a farmer really was a pretty horrible thing for most of the farming era and then and then of course by the end of that statues really started rising with the beginning of the industrial revolution and now of course in France people have actually attained or even slightly surpassed their paleolithic ancestors despite all these good things I think most of us admit or agree that we could be doing a lot better and the reason for that the one, one way to encapsulate that is something known as the epidemiological transition so the epidemiological transition is really um, some, a phenomenon of the last few hundred years. And it's well documented that over the last few hundred years, there's been a decrease in mortality because of infectious diseases. So how many of you in the room are really worried about dying from the plague? Oh, one person raises their hand. Thank you. <laughs> but you're probably a hypochondriac, and you probably shouldn't be worried about dying of the plague. <laughs> Smallpox, polio, et cetera, these are diseases we no longer really worry about. And the result is we, we die less from them. But there's been a concomitant increase in non-infectious chronic diseases, right? These have been going up, and we have good data from all around the world. If any of you are interested, there's an entire issue of The Lancet devoted to data worldwide data on this issue. I highly recommend the issue. It's a really fascinating issue. And so diseases like cancer, which are not a new disease, but there's no question that cancer is more prevalent now than it used to be. Um, heart disease is more prevalent than it used to be. But those are just the tip of the iceberg. There's also other diseases which may not kill you, but still create problems, like myopia, which is much more prevalent than it used to be. Uh, I would argue that there's not great data, but there's some data that lower back pain is more prevalent than it used to be. Cavities are certainly more common than they used to be during the Paleolithic. Flat feet, 30% of Americans have flat feet, but people who are barefoot almost never do. And arguably, there's a number of mental health issues that are also more prevalent, like Alzheimer's and insomnia and depression. Admittedly, we have less good data for some of these. And so a lot of folks in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the public health sector think, well, this is actually good news, right? If you gotta, after all, we all have to die of something, right? So if you're not gonna die of tuberculosis or smallpox 
or polio, aren't we lucky to get cancer or heart disease when we're older, right? I mean, that's really the argument that's often made, right? That, that essentially there's a trade-off, it's an inevitable trade-off, and as more people live longer, uh, more of us are going to get these diseases. And to some extent, that's actually true, right? Cancer, for example, is a disease that becomes more prevalent as you age because mutations accrue. So you're more likely to, um, um, as populations age, to see some of those diseases. But we have to understand also that that's only partly true. And people are often confusing diseases that are caused by old age with diseases that become more prevalent as you age. And there are plenty of people who are, of course, able to live to be old and long, healthy lives without getting these diseases. So they're not inevitable outcomes of aging. So there's an evolutionary medicine hypothesis. And so this evolutionary medicine, if you've not heard of this field, uh, hopefully you will, because it's, I think, one of the most important, maybe, I would argue, maybe the most important branch of evolutionary biology today. And it's the branch of biology which applies evolutionary theory to issues of health and disease. And there's a wonderful book, if you've never read it, it's still worth reading, it's called Why We Get Sick by by Nessie and Williams. Um, it actually sort of helped jumpstart this field. There's now a large uh, literature that's growing. There's even a journal devoted to evolutionary medicine. The argument, though, is that many of the diseases that we're encountering today, many of these chronic non-infectious diseases, are what we call mismatch diseases. Now, I did not come up with the term. This term has been around for a while. But mismatch diseases are defined as diseases that are more common today, more prevalent, more or more severe, because our bodies are poorly or inadequately adapted to the modern environmental conditions that we have created. What's the relationship between culture and the, uh, that, we, that we're creating and the biology that we're inheriting? And I think the way to think about it, or one way to think about it, is that not only does culture drive natural selection, for sure it does, but also culture creates its own dynamic by interacting with the bodies that we evolved over millennia. So what are the characteristics of diseases that cause this kind of disevolution? Well, the first thing is all diseases are caused by interactions between our genes that we inherited and the environments that we, we live in. And these are diseases that in which it's not the genes that are so important, but the environmental shifts cause the problem. So for example, we know there's actually a genetic component to flat feet. There's actually good data on that. But there hasn't been like, you know, a, a sudden sweep of that gene through the America in the last two few, few generations has caused this epidemic of flat feet in America. Secondly, most of the causes for these diseases are, are incremental. They're hard to perceive. They're difficult to even relate cause to effect, right? Every time you wear a, a shoe, you don't think, oh my gosh, my feet are going to become flat, right? Every time you have a teaspoon of sugar, you don't feel the pounds coming on, right? Um, these are difficult disease and they're, they're difficult um, um, stimuli to perceive they're, and hard to understand the relationship between cause and effect. Many of these diseases have very little effect on reproductive success. They occur when your, you know, heart disease, uh, for example, tends not to crop up in most people until uh, they're already grandparents, right? So it's not really directly affecting the reproductive success. Or flat feet, for example. I mean, how many of you with flat feet had trouble mating, right? Probably not many of you, right? They're not, you know, they're not that serious. So they're not, there's not going to be a strong selective effect on them. And then finally, all of these things have trade-offs, right? I'm not opposed to shoes. There's lots of good things about shoes. They can be sexy, they feel comfortable, they look good, they protect you from needles and dog crap on the street. There's all kinds of good reasons to wear shoes. So there's trade-offs for everything. And there's some reasons to, 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 to use these things, even if they have negative effects as well. So to kind of explore this, I'd like to take th uh, three different kinds of, of mismatch cycles, three kinds of disevolution, and think about um, how they might be contributing to this, this vicious circle. And we'll talk about environmental changes that are result in too much of a, of a stimulus, too little of a stimulus, or stimuli that are very novel for which evolution didn't prepare us. And of course, we'll start with too much. We evolved to be sort of the gas guzzlers of the primate world. We're very, very interesting a species from a perspective of energetics, we really use energy in a really interesting and impressive way. And one of the ways in which we use it is that we have really large brains. I'm happy to see that Leslie Aiello is here because she's published elegantly on this problem. But brains are very expensive tissues. You're, those of you sitting in the audience paying attention to me are using about 20% of your resting metabolism to pay for your brain. Those of you who are not listening to me are also spending 20% of your metabolism pay, pay, paying for your brain. Brains are very, very expensive tissues. And it took a lot of energy availability of energy for us to grow big brains, which started sometime around two million years ago and really accelerated and sort of hit modern size in the last uh, 500,000 years or so. So brains are big and costly. And in fact, an infant, for example, about 80% of its metabolism goes towards spending, paying for its big brain. 
But we also have very costly life histories. So our ancestors probably reproduced pretty slowly. So apes, for example, chimpanzees have offspring. Chimpanzee mothers have offspring every six years or so, right? But human hunter-gatherers are able to have them about every three years. So they've doubled the rate at which they're able to, to produce offspring. But at the same time, we take a lot longer growing them. So how did we get that energy? And the answer appears to have been the origins of hunting and gathering. It's a really important, complex way in which people uh, work together to get energy. And hunting and gathering is a, it's a system. It's a, system of, it's a behavioral system, right? And it involves tool making. It involves f uh, uh, um, food preparation, so cooking and food processing. It involves hunting. It involves running, I think. It involves throwing. It involves a division of labor and lots of cooperation and all kinds of things that work together to make hunting and gathering a, s a system. And, and, and it helps people also acquire lots of high energy foods, foods that are um, high in sugar, for example, like honey um, or meat and various other things like that, that turn into carbohydrates and fat, which are the, the basic key in, uh, kinds of food which for which you eat to get energy to pay for all the things that you do today. Right? But most hunter-gatherers don't have huge energy surpluses. They, they don't have to work terribly hard, but they don't have huge amounts of energy available to them. But that changed with the origins of agriculture when we started growing food. Now, farmers have to work pretty hard, but boy, can they get a lot of energy, right? So plowing a field and growing food and domesticating animals gave people access to a lot of carbohydrates and a lot of fat. But that only started about 600 generations ago. But it's completely transformed our planet. I'm pretty sure that everything that everybody ate in this room today uh, was domesticated. In fact, probably most of the calories that almost all of us ate came from just four kinds of foods. It came from cereals, tubers, maize, or rice, right? That's a, that's a, th those are all domesticated foods. We, um, in the Paleolithic, you can make uh, estimates about how much sugar people got in the Paleolithic from looking at hunter-gathering diets. And it's the good uh, reasonable estimate is that people got between about four to eight pounds of sugar a year if they're getting honey and stuff like that, right? But today, your average American consumes over 100 pounds of sugar a year. That's a pretty astonishing figure. But at the same time, we've removed fiber from our food. So uh, a typical American gets only 12 pounds of fiber a year, which is why so many people are constipated. But uh, hunter-gatherers, of course, get a lot more. They get a, maybe an estimate. This is a crude estimate, but fiber is, of course, very crude in its own nature. So maybe fiber is about 80 pounds a year, okay? So big shift, and that shift is pretty important because then that when you eat lots of sugar in the absence of fiber, it slams into your body at a really high rate. So you get lots of sugar at a high dose rate. So lots of glucose and lots of fructose, fructose is the really sweet stuff, in the absence of fiber, fiber slows the rate at which you digest it, causes you to have a high, you know, high insulin levels. The fructose goes straight to your liver where it gets turned mostly into fat because your liver can't burn that fructose fast enough, and it causes metabolic syndrome. Lots of central adiposity, you know, belly fat, high levels of cholesterol, high uh, levels of blood uh, sugars, and all kinds of other problems, uh, blood pressure, et cetera. And that leads to a number of diseases. Probably the, the sine qua non disease of uh, metabolic syndrome is diabetes. So what do we do with people who have type 2 diabetes? Well, there's two major ways of treating it. One is good old-fashioned exercise and diet, which we know works very well. Uh, as for, for example, look what it did for Bill Clinton, right? Um, and the other, of course, is medication. There are a lot of important medications out there which help deal with many parts of this metabolic pathway. But let's think about the difference between these two different pathways. The pharmaceuticals out there don't cure you of diabetes, but they mitigate the symptoms, which is fine. We should do that. We should give people drugs to, to pharmaceuticals to help mitigate the symptoms. But everybody agrees that uh, exercise and diet are more important because they can not only uh, prevent the disease from occurring in the first place. Actually, it turns out that very high levels of exercise, very serious diets, can actually, in some cases, reverse the disease. Many people don't actually know that. So I would make the case that type 2 diabetes is an example of disevolution that I was talking about earlier, right? It obeys all the criteria. There's a gene-environment interaction. I didn't talk about the genes, but there are certain genes which give people a greater proclivity towards getting the disease. But what's really shifted is the environments. For example, the reason that India is going undergoing an explosion in type 2 diabetes is not because genes are shifting in India, it's because environment is shifting in India, right? We also know that the causes of diabetes are incremental and not obvious. Every time you drink a glass of orange juice, you don't necessarily, you know, become suddenly diabetic or feel the diabetes coming on. Um, in most cases, it has little or no effect on reproduction because most people who get the disease tend to be older in life, so they're no longer having, their, they're no longer having kids. They tend to be grandparents at that point. And there's no question that there's a trade-off between the costs and the benefits of the factors that lead to type 2 diabetes. I mean, there's we can't, for example, get rid of carbohydrates and simple carbohydrates and stop you know, feeding the world grains. We have 7 billion people to feel. We can't just suddenly st have them no longer eat bread and, and rice and 
and you know, uh, imagine a world without bagels. It would be terrible, right? It would be just I incredible. So there are trade-offs, and we all accept those trade-offs. Okay, so that's an example. We can all, I'm sure you can think of lots of other examples of too much. Let's think of an example of too little, right? Here's a, there are many to pick from. And um, one that, of course, I'm very interested in is, is the musculoskeletal system. We all know that stress is very important for almost every system of your body. And by stress, I don't mean like emotional stress, like, you know, when you tell a joke and nobody laughs, which is very stressful. What I mean is a stress is a wh when you make a system of the body work harder. That's sort of the physiological definition of stress. And we all know that, for example, if you want your muscles to grow, you have to, you have to, you have, to have pain. You have to have strain, right, for in order for you to have gains. And we also know that if you don't continue to use your muscles, you lose it, as is very much obvious in the gover former governor of California. And there's a reason for that, right? And the reason for both of these is that you don't know how much capacity you want, so you want to have a, a labile response to stress so that you can have capacity match demand. Muscles are expensive. I told you earlier that your brain consumes about 20% of your body's metabolism. Most of us spend about 40% of our metabolism on muscles. So you don't want any more muscle than you need because it's going to cost you a lot, particularly if you're at a margin of energy balance, if you're hunter-gatherer. And if you have too much, well, you want to lose it, right? So the, if you're the governor of California, you would have to eat a lot, right? Just to, to, to you know, you're probably public embarrassment to eat as much as Arnold Schwarzenegger probably had to do when he was in the height of his, his bodybuilding days. So an important example of this is physical activity. And everybody knows, and I'm not going to belabor the, the, the evidence, that physical activity is important for inducing stresses in many systems of your body, from your brain to your immune system to your muscles to your bones, etc. It's very, very important for many systems of the body. So apes, for example, chimpanzees walk about two to three kilometers a day. I think your average gorilla walks less than one kilometer a day. Your average chimpanzee maybe climbs about 100 meters of tree. If you're a chimpanzee, do you know what you spend most of your day doing? Eating. Eating, chimpanzees spent 50% of their day just putting food in their mouth, and then they have to wait till that food digests so they can fill their belly again. And they basically do that all day long, and they occasionally copulate and run around and do other exciting things. But mostly, they just simply feed. That's what they do. But humans have evolved a very different system. We are very active. Your average hunter-gatherer female walks about 9 kilometers a day. Your average hunter-gatherer male walks about 15 kilometers. And there are many ways to measure physical activity, but a very simple, it's a very simplistic measure is something called the physical activity level, or your PAL. Your PAL is basically how much energy you're expending divided by your basal metabolic rate, how much it takes energy it takes just to lie in bed and do nothing but watch sitcoms all day, right? And so it turns out that data show that hunter-gatherers, their physical activity levels average about 1.9. There's a lot of variation around these, these numbers. Some, these are just means, right? There's not all the variation here. Subsistence farmers have to work a little bit harder than hunter-gatherers, but today, uh, most uh, sedentary Americans have physical activity levels of about 1.5 or 1.6. That's a pretty significant reduction. That's a 15 to 20 percent reduction. Now, what does a 15 to 20 percent reduction in physical activity level mean? Well, it's pretty... Let me get, uh, actually, before I do that, let me give you an example of something that just happened over the last few hundred years. So my grandmother, who lived in Brooklyn, she used to have a, an old pedal sewing machine. She loved it. And I mean, when I was a kid, I remember going here, and she would, she would be pedaling away on her machine. And there are actually people who measured, they put oxygen masks on people, and they measure how much it costs to use a sewing machine with a pedal. And then they measure how much it costs, for example, the mayor of London here to use an electronic machine uh, without a pedal. And it turns out to be a difference of 15 calories an hour, about a 15% reduction. And you think, okay, big deal, 15 calories an hour. But imagine your job, imagine Boris here had a union job, right? She's only working five days a week for eight hours a week for 50 weeks a year. Do you know how many calories that is in a year? Well, you can whip out your iPhone and do the calculation, or I'll do it for you. It's 52,000 calories in a year, which is enough to run 18 New York marathons. That's a pretty substantial reduction. And that's just from putting a machine, you know, an, an engine on a sewing machine. Imagine all the, the elevators and the escalators and shopping carts. And you can even buy, you know, electric toothbrushes and, you know, I mean, all kinds of great stuff out there. We've reduced how much energy we expend in many dimensions of our life, and the estimates are that today, Americans spend, on average, 300 to 500 calories less per day being physically active. That's an average estimate, right? So that's a, yeah, so if you keep your diet the same, you know, you don't have to invoke any very complex uh, biological arguments to understand um, how we're getting bigger. But another insidious effect of this loss of physical activity is osteoporosis, which is a, a disease that affects more than 30% of women in the United States over the age of 50. It's becoming more prevalent also in men. It now affects about 10% of men. And it's a disease that, apparently, as far as we can tell, is rare or completely unknown among hunter-gatherers of subsistence populations. There's no evidence that I know of 
that exists, and it basically comes from applying forces to your body. And there's a reason for this response to loading, because bones are costly. You don't want to have any more than you need, and you don't want to have any less than you need, which is why when you become more active, you add bone, and when you become very less active, or you go to like space where there's no gravity, you start losing bone. So there's this trade-off between growing it and losing it. That makes sense. But the problem is that there's a pernicious and ancient constraint, which is that we grow our skeletons when we're young. Right? So most people grow um, their bones and they get peak bone mass between the age of about 20 and 30, and there's a lot of evidence which shows that people who are more active attain higher peak bone mass. So if you're inactive when you're growing, you attain less bone uh, by the time you're 20 or 30. And then, there and then after that point, we're all screwed. We're all going to lose bone for the rest of our life. And unfortunately, if you're a, a female, you're going to lose bone faster once you go through menopause because estrogen has a protective effect on bone health. And it turns out that women uh, or people who are less active um, actually lose bone at a faster rate. And so the end result is that if you're less active when you're young, you achieve less bone mass. If you're less active as you continue to age, you lose bone faster, and you're just more likely to f fall below that threshold that causes osteoporosis. So I would argue that osteoporosis is also an example of disevolution. Now, since we're all depressed, let's talk about something maybe a little bit less depressing. Let's talk about things that are too new, right? Things that are novel, that we never encountered before in our, in our evolutionary history, like DDT, right? Caveman never really had to worry about DDT, or car crashes, or smoking, or bungee jumping. Uh, we can think of all these things as being novel. We're obviously not adapted for them, but that's not really uh, scientifically very interesting. But how about this guy here, right? He's, he looks like a comfortable gent, right? He's sitting there with his shoes and his newspaper and he's reading in a chair, etc. I think, what could be more normal, right? But everything this guy is doing is killers, right? He's going to die from them all, right? <laughs> in fact, well, okay, maybe that's a little bit of hyperbole, but let's, let's just talk about one of these things. Let's talk about reading, right? Because we think about reading as being normal and natural. We encourage our children to do it, but of course, it's only very recently. In fact, and it wasn't until 3000 BC that anybody read anything at all, basically, and it was only until the Industrial Revolution that universal literacy started occurring in developed countries like England. And it turns out that that's when myopia started occurring. But f various studies of hunter-gatherers and subsistence populations have found repeatedly that myopia is extremely rare, right? It's very rare among the Inuit. It's very rare among, you know, f uh, uh, subsistence farmers in, in Polynesia, etc. There's many, many studies all around the world that show that it's less than 3% in these populations. Less than 3%. And myopia is caused by having an eyeball that's too long, right? So basically, everything is th that's far looks blurry. And it turns out that there are two major causes for this. And there's a huge debate that's going on, actually, in ophthalmology, so I'm not going to pick sides here, because uh, I suspect that both are true. But one is, th is close work. So spending a lot of time looking at things up close, like reading, right, or sewing, or microscopy. You know, any microscopists here? Right, right, yeah, you have bad eyes. Look at that, I can see that, right? Um, 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 it's actually that microscopists are famous for having particularly, there's actually a big cottage industry of research on microscopy eyes, but anyway. Um, but what happens is that when you're looking at things that are up close, you're constantly stretching, uh, you're constantly firing the ciliary muscles that attach onto the, the filaments that hold the lens in place. Those filaments are called, by the way, the zonules of Zen. I just had to say that. And um, stretching, uh, firing those ciliary muscles actually puts tension on the eyeball, and it actually raises uh, the pressures inside this major aqueous chamber of the eyeball, and that's thought to cause elongation and stretching, which then leads to the eyeball being longer. But it turns out that if you like, sew up the eyelids of little kitty cats, which people did, I'm sorry to say, um, turns out those little kitty cats, they didn't do this for myopia studies, it was for other research, but they found out that, th that those eyeballs were too long. Now, those cats obviously had not been reading, right? And so further experiments where they have, you know, Cats and chickens and things wear glasses that, fur that, 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 that blur of vision, et cetera, and, and reduce visual stimulus have shown that an absence of complex visual stimulus can also cause your eyeballs to become too long. And so it turns out that there's good data which show that children, for example, who spend more time outdoors, independent of how much they read, are much less likely to develop myopia. So probably both uh, factors are going on in terms of uh, this problem. So I think we can agree that myopia is another example, a little less scary than osteoporosis or, or diabetes. Another example, though, of disevolution, right? It's caused by a gene-environment interaction. There are genes, again, which do predispose you, but these genes haven't been sweeping through populations in the last few generations. Rather, it's the environments that we live in, reading lots, spending a lot of time indoors, doing microscopy, whatever, which cause people to get uh, uh, myopia. Each time you read uh, a book or, or, or spend an afternoon inside, you don't feel your eye eyeballs growing longer, you know, you can't really feel the stimulus. Um, there's certainly um, no effect on reproduction. In fact, I think people who wear eyeglasses are rather attractive. And then finally, 
And none of us would basically have our children stop reading or spend all their time outdoors. There's no question that the benefits outweigh the costs of having to go and buy eyeglasses. So finally, um, now that I've um, um, depressed you all about, um, um, about um, how uh, the, in, in the interaction between our Paleolithic bodies and our modern worlds can, can lead to this epidemiological transition, I'd like to conclude by asking how can evolutionary theory and thinking about evolution help us get out of this mess, right? How can we do better um, by thinking about evolution? So um, I would uh, repeat again the famous statement by Theodosius Dobzhansky that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I would include medicine in that statement, right? And I would argue that this epidemiological kind of transition uh, can only really be interpreted and only be countered by using an evolutionary framework. Let's think about what are options. Well, our first option is to do nothing. Let's just, you know, let nature sort the problem out. Let's let natural selection act and get rid of all those myopics and and <coughs> get rid of all those flat-footed people and get rid of all those diabetics, etc. Well, there's obviously two flaws to this problem. The first is it's cruel and inhumane, um, and it's <laughs> inappropriate. Secondly, um, natural selection, even if it were to operate on these things, would take a long time. It wouldn't help us or our children or our grandchildren. Um, and, and, um, and third, it's not even necessary that it would happen because you need to have the heritable variations to exist in the first place, plus the selective conditions for them to act for natural selection to really solve the problem. So I think we can agree we can cross this one off for many, many reasons. Number two and number three is really what we're doing now, right? We can invest more in treatment and we can help educate people more to understand their bodies. So we can spend more money, send more money of your tax dollars to NIH so scientists in white lab coats can come up with solutions to diabetes and cancer, et cetera, and I'm all for that. We should, we should increase our budget on research for, for treating diseases because that's the right thing to do. Um, but I think um, um, it's science fiction to think that we're going to solve these, these diseases easily. They're complex diseases. They're caused by many, many genes. Most of these genes have very small effects. Most of the genes turn out to be very rare. Uh, most of the pathways are difficult to treat. Um, there's no going to be p pasteur for these chronic non-infectious diseases. There's no microbe you can identify and kill, right, and thereby solve the problem of smallpox or whatever. Most of these diseases are going to be very difficult to treat, and we can only expect incremental progress. It's going to take a long time, lots and lots of research, many, many PhDs sacrificing their careers. Slowly, slowly, we can get uh, some progress. Education is also important, but education only goes so far. I mean, if you tell people to eat a healthy diet, will they eat a healthy diet? The answer is, health, sadly, no. It's, not, it's only, so, only so effective. I mean, we need to do it, of course, but it only uh, has so much effect. But the final solution is to change our environments. And I think that's where, from an evolutionary perspective, it makes the most sense. Because like it or not, we evolved to be bipeds, sweaty, slightly fat bipeds that are, you know, furless and big-brained and dependent on using tools. And we, l we, l we, we evolved to eat a diet that's high in fiber and low in carbohydrates. But we also evolved to crave sugar. We evolved to, you know, to crave starch, to crave fat. We evolved to be very physically active, but we also evolved to be lazy because, you know, if, if there were escalators in the Kalahari Desert, I promise you the, the hunter-gatherers there would be using them too. It makes sense to save energy when you're on the margin of energy balance. It makes sense. It's, an evolu it's clearly an evolutionary adaptation, even though I'm not, a, I'm not even a big sociobiologist, but even I will agree with that one. So we evolved to be physically active, but enjoy rest and comfort and more. And so uh, we need to confront these ideas because uh, it, it's clear that we evolved we never evolved to make the kinds of choices that we have to make today. So if you're able to go back, you know, a few hundred generations, a few thousand generations ago and listen in on a, on a homo erectus mother, and this is from the Indonesian Museum, you know, talking to her daughter about, you know, what you're going to do today, she's probably not going to tell her daughter, don't forget to eat the healthy food and exercise, right? That kid had no option but to eat the healthy food and to exercise. That's what you did every day. But now we have to exhort our children to make choices for which we're really not prepared from an evolutionary perspective, right? And so we have this mismatch between old genes and old aspects of our biology, which we really can't change very easily, and novel environments, which we really actually can change. We've done it in, in many respects. Why can't we do it for, for some other things? But it's going to require either coercion or nudging, right? So we can do what um, you know, you've done here in New York and ban trans fats, which I suspect is a good thing, right? How many people here approve of the trans fat ban in New York, right? Okay, well, we have a very nice liberal crowd here at Upper East Side, right? Uh, maybe, you know, we require physical ex education in schools, though we don't, I think we require it enough, or they, it's often pretty measly. Um, we have, many schools now have junk food bans where you can't buy junk food in schools, right? So that's coercion, right? We're, 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 we're basically shifting our environments 
without, um, without uh, asking people's permission. Or the other approach is to do nudges, right? To kind of help us help ourselves, help us act in our own self best interest without, without taking away our rights. So that occurred through tax, right? So we could, for example, have a tax on soda. We've done this for cigarettes, right? Cigarettes and alcohol, we've actually done, you know, it used to be 50% of Americans used to, Americans used to smoke. We're now down to about 20% through pretty modest means, actually. S taxes, and they were very, they were fought over, you know, tooth and nail, but actually cigarette taxes and bans on advertising, et cetera, are not that all radical, right? And why can't we do that, for example, for sugar, which is poisoning many of our children, or for junk food? Or I mean, how many of you in the room have thought that we're a, a f in favor of uh, Mayor Bloomberg's uh, big gulp ban, which I would consider a nudge, right? Oh, it's not so popular in this room, okay? Maybe about 50%, okay? I mean, he's not preventing you from drinking soda. You just have to use two hands to get 32 <laughs> ounces, not one hand, right? I would consider that a nudge. It's not taking away a right. But we're all, you know, we can have a debate about that later on. Now, I think when you apply that to adults, it gets very controversial. But who disagrees about that for children? We already we coerce our children, right? We require them to wear seatbelts. We require them to go to school. Most states require inoculations. How would that be any different from really actually requiring proper physical education in schools? Children need about an hour of, uh, of strenuous physical activity every day to grow a healthy body. And very few children in the United States get that. And we're really, um, we're, not, we're doing our children a great disservice by, by not making them run around more. Um, we also agree that, you know, you shouldn't have children smoke and you shouldn't have children drink, those are coercions, so why not have similar laws to restrict the amount of junk food that they get? I mean, how different really is it when you consider that 30% of American children are overweight and they can't make rational decisions on their own? So we have to make it for them so that they can grow healthy bodies. Um, so I hope that I uh, convinced you that evolution uh, not only explains why our bodies are the way they are, but evolution really still matters, right? It helps explain not only our, uh, why we are the way we are, but how we, why we get sick, but I also think it provides us clues, pathways, ways to think about how we can make the world a better place and how we can do better with ourselves. So for that, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to especially thank the Leakey Foundation, and I'd like to thank the m and and I'm sorry I went on for so long. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>